Well, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're going to continue on with the series I started on the Kingdom of God and the first one we did was the other day and we're going to do the, the second one now. Um, so let's pick up with the second uh, to start the second teaching. Um, in our last one we ended up with talking about how what does it mean to walk and live in this kingdom. I'm going to pick up with that today. I want to take that a little bit further. Then I also want to bring out is another connection, and that is the connection of power in the kingdom. And then also I want to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Now I'm not going to get into um, going into any detail about the gifts of the Spirit. I do that in another series of teachings. I go into quite a bit of depth on that, but we'll hit that at another time. I want to start with uh, the fruits of the Spirit, which we're all familiar with. And that's in Galatians 5, 22-24, and it says this, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Now, the, this is a very familiar set of scriptures. Lots of Christians know about these verse, these two verses, two or three verses. But what I find a lot of, it, even though we know about these, I find our lives are don't line up with what these qualities are ex telling us to do. Uh, so I want I want to read now another place in the scripture. This is at First Corinthians chapter one, ten through fifteen. Again, First Corinthians chapter one, ten through fifteen. And this is an example of new Christians and who are living carnal lives at the, beginnings of the, at the beginning of their walks. It says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no uh, divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in, through, in thought and purpose. For some members of close household have told me about your quarrels. My dear brothers and sisters, some of you are saying I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying I follow Apollos and I follow Peter or I follow Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for, for now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. So here we see an example of, of uh, these, these leaders uh, being segmented out by the members of a, of a household. And it says here it was, it was, it was in a household, it was in Chloris household. So these were, these were people meeting in a house who had disagreements or quarrels on who I guess who are the most important leaders and the ones that they kind of favored over other ones. And when Paul heard about this, he addressed this because what was happening in the house church was they were beginning to quarrel and argue between themselves. And so Paul right away addressed this and he, he said, this, this has got to stop. And, and uh, he didn't want them breaking off fellowship. And, and, and so I'm assuming the scripture never says anything more about this, but I'm assuming these these brothers and sisters got together, they asked each other's forgiveness, and they, re, uh, they, they uh, got fellowshipping going again and got everything straightened around. Um, but quite honestly, I find in the church at large today, there are brothers and sisters who come into disagreement over, over far things lesser than this, and they end up breaking fellowship and going to other churches or staying home. That makes me very sad to see that happening because we're missing, we're missing out on the opportunity to work out our differences. Now, I want to, I want to talk about um, differences. Differences many times crop up in between brothers and sisters, especially those who are in the same church and are put together. Uh, it seems like those who have the opportunity to have a closeness in relationship also can share in differences. And when this happens, and people ended up breaking off fellowship, they have just missed an opportunity to have revelation shown to them. I personally believe when differences come up, 
we what is what it, what is the things are being set up for is is a revealing of things that people didn't understand before or in other words revelation is about to come into the group um now something is very important in this atmosphere is that there's discipleship going on now i don't want to get in a lot on discipleship because i want to cover that later on but i i find today there's not a lot of discipleship going on and quite honestly, um, many people will say, well, I'm being discipled by Christ, uh, or they may, you know, that sort of thing. But, and that is true, and all about the Holy Spirit, and that is true. The Holy Spirit does disciple us, absolutely. God disciples us. But when you look up the word discipleship, it, it also, and you study it, it also brings in the aspect that it's people discipling people as well. And so when you're in a church setting and you have true discipleship going on, these quarrels that crop up in the church can be settled more easily if there's true discipleship taking place. But like I said before, I, I don't see this going on quite honestly a whole lot. So, so when there's differences then, we have the possibility of further revelation uh, to settle our differences if we can do that. Now to settle quarrels, to settle disagreements, is kingdom living because we are meant to come into unity we're meant to come into one thought and to have the same purpose in mind that's the purpose of meeting together now it's not like that when we first meet but that's where it's to lead to now it's it's very important that the the major aspect in amongst god's people is that always needs to be there is having a deep affectionate or a deep love or a deep respect for one another. If we, de if we dearly love somebody, it's very hard to sin against somebody that loves you. It's much more difficult. If, you, if you're around somebody and you don't really care for that person that much, a brother and sister, it's easier to sin against them. But you, when you have somebody that you know loves you, it's harder to sin against that person. And that's what should be developing amongst the, the, the church or the body of Christ all the time is deepness in love. Uh, and that'll hold, that'll hold the church together. Now, when that is going on and you are tempted to um, let a quarrel or a difference break you away from fellowshipping, it's much tougher to do that. What it should, when we are loving people, what should happen is we should, we should be in great pain. We should be broken uh, because of what's happening between us. Now, if we find that there's separation that takes place, or another factor I see that happens so much is the whole aspect of brothers and sisters avoiding each other in the same meeting. Now, why does that happen and why does separation take place? Like where I mean your brothers and sisters, something said, you quarrel and you leave, you go someplace else, is because separation is an attribute that there's sin. And wherever that's going on, you can bet, you can be, you can bet on there, there's differences there that have never been worked out. So the whole idea of differences and quarrels amongst us is not something unusual. It's not something unheard of. That stuff happens. And therefore, we have to be prepared by loving each other deeply and, and being transparent and truthful with one another while we're settling those differences. The next part, the next connection is, is the power uh, and the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 4.20, it says for this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. It is living by God's power. So, so am I saying the kingdom of God, if in, in a setting where the church meets together, if we never see power on display, am I saying that people don't understand the kingdom in that setting? Yes, I am. Because there should be, there should be power put on display frequently in settings where the church gets together. And why is that? So that, so as people are part of putting on display of the power of God, they in turn, amongst themselves, they in turn eventually will turn outward and start putting on power displays amongst society in general. Uh, and I want to read another scripture to you just so to prove this point about the power of God. Luke eleven twenty it says this, but, I am, but if I am casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among me, among you. So wherever you see 
the enemy being dealt with and demons are being cast out, that's a, that's a signal to us the kingdom is really working here. And then I want to read one other place in Romans 15. Now this is towards the end of Paul's life in Romans 15 verses 18 and 19. What Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked uh, among them, they were convinced by what? By the power of the miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit. So this, this is like, this is like a, this is like a two forked road going down and they're, they're both parallel one to another. And what's, what's happening here is Paul is saying, look, I preach the message of the, I preach the message, the gospel message to people, but I just didn't do that. I also showed them signs and wonders. I showed them the miraculous. So these two things go together. They should be happening all the time. Now, generally what I tend to see, and I, I see it all over, is I see lots of people preaching and teaching uh, the Word of God. They're presenting principles that they have learned either from the Bible or principles they've learned from reading books. And I find that lots of people are always looking for the, for the, newest, for the newest teaching, how to, the newest handle on the latest idea on how they're going to present this to people to hopefully to grow people up. Now, I, I, what I'm saying here is teaching this way from principles only is, is, leaves the power of God out. Now, am I saying teaching principles is wrong? No, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that. But there's another way of teaching that, that needs to be brought out in the open. And that is revelatory teaching. Teaching where you're teaching from something that you yourself got from God. It's something new. It's something that was, that was unknown at some point. And all of a sudden you got a revelation of it. And now you're so excited about it that you start, you start telling other people. Well, before you tell other people, you're moving in the good, the, the, the good of that, and then you start sharing with other people. Revelation always starts on the inside of us. And as we, as we have it on the inside of us, we're pondering and thinking about it. It begins to grow in us. And as we share this truth, it begins to come outside of us, and it begins to impact others that are around us. Now, so what I'm saying is, in teaching and preaching, there should be revelation that's flowing along with that. But in addition to that, there also should be the, the power of the, of, of the Spirit moving along with that as well. They're both, they both are necessary. So we, we mustn't disassociate power away from our, our meetings. They, they must be involved in our meetings. All right, I want to read to you now of uh, Scripture, and this demonstrates this very well. This is in Luke 6 verse 12 and then verse 17 through 19 it says one day soon after jesus went up on a mountain to pray and he prayed to god all night at daybreak he called together all his disciples all his disciples and chose 12 of them to be his apostles when they came down from the mountain the disciples stood with jesus on a large level area surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds there were people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and from as far north as the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone tried to touch and become, and because healing power went out from him and he healed everyone. So why did they come to this? Why did they come to see Jesus? They came to hear and to be healed. In other words, they came to hear the message. They came to be a, to receive the, the empowerment from Jesus to have their to be healed and set free. And what happened in this meeting? Well, Jesus went and prayed all night for the purpose because God had told him he was to select twelve apostles. So he went to pray all night. And and I just I just want to explain how I personally view this. I do not think Jesus was on his knees with his head bound between his legs all night long and, and praying. I think he was praying all night, but I think he was probably laying on his back, worshiping, laughing, crying, uh, and just having, I think, I think he had a, 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 a cross section of his emotions going on because he was in the presence of his father. I think that time flew. I think Jesus, after spending hours in his father's presence, all of a sudden saw the sun coming up. He says, oh my gosh, it just seemed like we just got started, dad. And here it is, morning ready. Well, in this process of, of 
of, of worshiping his father, he told him the 12 he wanted him to, to choose. But we have to realize he had been in the Father's presence for hours. Now, you cannot just spend that kind of time in your Father's presence and not be affected by it. There's other scriptures that talk about when you're in the presence of God, he says you go from glory to glory. You're being transformed into the very image of Christ. This was what was happening to Jesus in his Father's presence. So there was, it was like, if I could say it metaphorically in a different way, it's like Jesus was dripping wet in the glory of God. So he came out of, this, out of the presence of his father, went and chose the 12. But now there's like there's, there's, there's an abundance amount of, of the presence or the glory of God all around him. So what does he do? Now, typically in most churches today, if that was going on, they, the, the first thing that comes to mind is you go around and lay hands on people, pray over people. Jesus didn't do that. He found a level spot. He just stood there. Somehow the people proceed. If I just touch this guy, Jesus, I'm going to be healed. And it doesn't, it doesn't describe how they touched him. I don't know if they came down upon him or they, they walked in front of him. I don't know. It just says all who were sick touched him and all who touched him, they were all healed. And so it never says Jesus prayed for anybody. So you, you kind of get the idea. He just stood there. And people just went by and just touched him and immediately healed. You imagine the cripple coming up, touching him, and, all, and he, he, he's limping on the way up. He touches Jesus and he walks away jumping because he got healed. And Jesus is just watching all this. He's not saying anything. It doesn't say in the word he was talking to anybody. And I find, I find that amazing. That stirs me tremendously. So there's something about being in the presence of our Father. And I, I put together a series of teachings, uh, it's been several years ago about that, and I'm, we'll get into that another time, but authority comes in the commission. When we're commissioned by God to go out and do something, he gives us authority. It talks about that. But in the encounter, in the encountering of God comes the power. So as we spend time in God's presence, we are changed. We really are changed on the inside. So it's no wonder as we are spending time in God's presence, should we not expect to see more people get healed, more people get set free? Absolutely. This is part of the kingdom. This is one way of putting the kingdom on the, the kingdom on display by the power that's being exhibited by people getting healed and delivered. Now, it's very important how we view Jesus. Um, when we think of this, what I just read in, in Luke in Luke six. We many times will think, well, that was, that was Jesus. That's the Son of God. He can do those kind of things. Well, if we're thinking that way, I'm not saying that's wrong, but when we, say, when we say to ourselves, that's Jesus, the Son of God, we have placed Jesus up on a pedestal. When you place Jesus upon a pedestal, how on earth can we become like him? And didn't Jesus say, one of the gospels, that you'll do even greater things than me? So I think some of the way the, the way that we view Jesus is very important. We have to remember, it's very important for us to remember Jesus at this point, when he spent all night in prayer with his father and worshiping him, he was a man. I'm not saying he wasn't the son of God. I'm not devaluing Jesus at all. I'm just saying it, it also says in scripture, he was a son of man. He was a human being just like us. He was no different than us. Now, he had never sinned. Now, you're going to say, well, that's right. He had never sinned. That's why he could do that. And I said, now, wait a minute. That's right. He had never sinned. But when we get born again, all of our sins are washed away. So we stand at the same place that Jesus is. No sin? He had no sin. He had to have the Holy Spirit to do these things. We have to have the Holy Spirit do these things. He moved in the supernatural. And he says, you're going to move in the supernatural, but you're even expected to do greater things than me. I find that amazing. So it's important that we not hold Jesus on a pedestal, that he wants us, he wants us to rise up to the person that we're supposed to be. He wants us to reach our destiny that he has for us. And so to do that, we have to realize that if I see Jesus as a man, I can emulate what he is and what he did. I can do it, and then I realize I can even do more. Now, when I say do more, did that has that already happened? Yes, it has. Peter, when he in the book in the first in uh, the beginning of Acts, went around and wherever he walked, 
and his shadow was falling on people and they were getting healed. I don't think Jesus healed with a shadow. I don't think. Paul with handkerchiefs was healing people. I don't think Jesus did that. And so these guys were moving beyond where Jesus was. And are we supposed to do this? Are we to do the same thing and go beyond? Absolutely, we are. But it's under, and we can do that if we, and part of that is understanding the kingdom. Now we mustn't forget, in Acts 1 8, it says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So we got to keep that in mind. It's the Holy Spirit coming upon us that makes these things happen. All right. Now there's, um, now if we, if we don't understand the kingdom and we don't realize, even though we read the word about the power of God, but the, we don't, we're not seeing the power of God move like we should in our meetings, what do we default to? In other words, what ends up happening? Typically what happens is we go, we fall into religiosity. We start falling into a rut of whatever is presented to us and we think this is what Christianity is. All I'm trying to do here today is to break you out of, if you're in a rut, get out of the rut and realize what Jesus has called us to do. Miraculous things, move in the power of God and, if, and, if, and to get rid of religion. All right, I want to read 1 Corinthians 12, verses eight through 11. These are the gifts of the Spirit. I'm not gonna go into detail explaining them. I have another series of teachings on that. I'll get into that sometime, but I just want to read through these and point out <clears throat> a sentence at the end. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and, and to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now we need, we need to understand here that the kingdom of God has to do with, as I mentioned in the first teaching, our advocate is the spirit. So now I'm taking this further and saying, okay, if we're moving by the kingdom of God, then we, we are cultivating a relationship with the spirit. And what does that mean exactly? That means the spirit wants to manifest itself through us, the members. And so, so it, and who does this? The spirit of God does. The spirit chooses. So in a meeting, Typically, many times, if the Spirit of God is being manifested in meetings, typically what I see is most of the time it's manifested through the leader of the meeting. Now, that's okay, but that's not what the Word says here. It says that the, the work of the one and the same Spirit distributes them just as He determines. That means that the Spirit looks over the meeting. He looks at everybody, all the members, the leaders, everybody, and he decides who he's going to put his anointing. He's going to put, he's going to pour out this gift of the Holy Spirit and which gift he's going to put on them so they can manifest that in the meeting. And that involves everyone. That involves allowing the Spirit of God to move as he so, so desires. This is the way the Spirit wants to move. It's the Spirit wanting to move through people. So we have to, every member of the church has to make themselves available to the Spirit. The leadership in a church should make, should make the people aware of the fact that the Spirit wants to move through them. And there should be time given in every meeting for the Spirit of God to be able to move as He so wishes in a meeting. Now I know what I'm saying is contrary, so contrary, to meetings today. Meetings in, in general, are there's usually four to five parts of a meeting. One is we worship, we have announcements, we have a teaching or preaching, we, we have the offering, and then we may or may not have an altar call. So there's about four or five things, and those, those steps are really predictable. You can almost tell you every time in a meeting when they're gonna happen, the time it's gonna happen, and everything. Now, am I, Am I saying that's by the Spirit? No, it's not. I don't believe it is. Not according to these, when the Spirit says He will distribute the gifts, there's no allowances being made for the members to be able to move in, the, in this way. The, the tendency in churches is to distance himself from the Spirit doing what He wants, because that can be either, either it's 
it's not understood that way by the leadership or they don't want to mess with it because it can get a little messy because it gets out of because they can't control it it's the spirit now moving and doing things now i'm not i know things have to be done decently and in an order but quite honestly i think things are in too much of an order frankly with the spirit the spirit is bound up now if the spirit is not able to move in other words when a meeting starts people come in People have issues. Some of them are sick. Some of them have been, been lied to by the enemy all week long. Some of them are discouraged. Some of them are, are um, uh, upset. They come into the meeting. Now, if the me when the meeting's over, if they leave with those same problems, all I am saying is the spirit was not able to move because it's not the will of God that people come into a meeting and leave with those same problems. That should not be happening. And that means then... That the, that the enemy is playing havoc on God's people. Okay, so we'll wrap things up here and we'll pick up again to start the next section.